Okay, everybody, make sure you stay tuned to the end of this video to find out how you can win as something really, really cool that I actually don't have with me right now, but I will describe it to you. And I think it's something that you would like. I promise you that. So today we're going to go over our top 10 greatest Seattle Mariners starting pitchers of all time. There's some caveats here. Um, one caveat and then a few uh, just interesting things, I guess. The caveat is no current starting pitcher on the Seattle Mariners is eligible for this list. So Luis Castillo, who I think probably already would qualify for this, is not eligible. Marco Gonzalez, who I think sadly is sadly the right term for this, uh, maybe could qualify for this list. Not eligible. George Kirby, um, Tommy Malone, all not eligible for this list. So just keep that in mind. So there, you will not hear me talk about Castillo, Gonzalez, a few others. The other thing that's interesting about this list, I'm doing this right now, live. I have my list, but I have not decided on who the top is. The debate between number two and number one, at least in my eyes, is tough. I think you probably know who they are. We'll see. Uh, just some quick names that will not make this list, but that I did consider. Joel Pinheiro. Joel Pinheiro was a really solid starter for them at a time when they were really good, and uh, sometimes when they were not so good. I did consider Joel Pinheiro for the list. I know a lot of people hate this guy. Jeff Facero, for a couple of years, was really good. Really, really good. Uh, in terms of peak, he probably does belong on this list. Unfortunately, he just fell apart so much that... You can't put him on this list. Uh, Aaron Seeley, a couple of really solid years. Didn't like, more of a, a guy that I don't know the nice way to say this. He was fortunate to get the win totals that he did because he, you know, he didn't miss a lot of bats and he had some pretty average ERAs. But because he pitched deep into games, he was able to get a chance to get a lot of decisions. And because he played on the 2000 and 2001 Seattle Mariners. He got a lot of chances to win. Uh, and Cliff Lee, I know it was only half a season. What a half a season it was. My goodness gracious, that was so... That year stunk so much because there were such high expectations. And to say they didn't live up to those expectations is the understatement of understatements. But he was really good. And, you know, I'm going to be completely honest with you folks. The Seattle Mariners starting pitcher list is, uh, it's not great. It's not great, folks. There are, there are some great pitchers. Two guys, one that's already in the Hall of Fame and one that I will be pounding the drum to make the Hall of Fame for. But the rest of these guys, no shot. No shot. In fact, I think only one of these guys after those two is really a Seattle Mariner Hall of Famer. But enough negative. Let's talk about the positives. Uh, number 10, I'm going with Floyd Bannister. Okay, I will admit this. There is a little bit of personal bias for me. Uh, my dad faced Floyd Bannister in high school. And I don't know why I think that's cool, but I do. And look, he was pretty solid over his four years. Um going to be doing a lot of baseball referencing with this one because it's a little harder to just, you know, have the full list. But so he only went 40 and 50, but he had a 3.75 ERA and he's among by war the all time leaders in Seattle Mariner uh, starting pitchers. We're darning with faint praise. I'm, t I'm telling you, folks, this is not a great list of I mean, a deep list. It's a good list, but it is. And please keep watching. You want to win that thing I'm going to tell you about. But there were a couple of really good years for Bannister. Uh, led, I believe, baseball and strikeouts in his last year as a Mariner. Was much better in terms of wins and losses, I believe, when he went to the White Sox. But that's who I've got at number 10, and I'm sticking with it. Uh, number nine is a current pitcher, but one who doesn't play for the Mariners anymore. And I'm going with James Paxton. Yeah, the thing that hurts Paxton on this list is he never went over 160 innings. But... I believe he had two years with an ERA, uh, just a one year below three, but he did have a 3.04 ERA in that first foolish season. I mean, he was great. He was really strong, and uh, it's awesome 
to see that he's starting to show that with Boston again this year. 3.81, 3.81 ERA isn't great, but 36 to 9 strikeout to walk ratio. He's showing that ability to miss bats. I am rooting hard for that guy. It's been very fun to see him pitch well. Uh, and Paxton played on a couple of decent Seattle Mariner teams. Not great. The, the thing that hurts him is that he was only here from 2013 to 2018, which is, you know, not a short time, but he never made 30 starts and he never threw over 160 innings, made the most of those. And again, there is room on this list for pitchers like James Paxton. Uh, number eight, Mike Moore, who <laughs> lost 19 games for the Seattle Mariners in one of his final seasons and was much better in his time with Oakland than it was with Seattle. Um, I believe helped him win a world series. I just got a text that said, yeah, that's exactly what he did. Except that's not what happened at all. I just forgot to turn my notifications off. I sure wish I'd turned off my notifications before I started this video, but I didn't. <laughs> Moore was look at a time when the Seattle Mariners were not very good. And this was the, I believe first overall draft pick, uh, almost a hundred percent sure about that out of good old Oral Roberts University. Be, 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 be mature. Um, solid 17 and 10 one year with a 3.46 ERA, you know, allowed a lot of hits, but also played behind some bad defense. One of the better innings eaters for the early part of the Mariners team went on to Oakland and had a much better time there. I believe led baseball and starts actually for a few years, even with Detroit, his last couple of years did that as well. Um, number eight, Mike Moore. Not great for a number eight, if I'm being completely honest with you. Uh, number seven is not so great either, but it's Eric Hansen. H Hansen was like probably outside of another guy on this list in the early part of the Mariners, the actual like, oh, this is, this is like a legit, um, top of the rotation starter one of the absolute first for the seattle mariners had a 3.24 era in 1990 uh went 18 and 9 that year i know win loss record doesn't matter much was in one of the more interesting trades of my life i believe the full trade and I, you know what let's not even try to remember let's just look at the thing so he was traded with brett boone to the cincinnati reds for bobby ayala and dan wilson man talk about some remembering some guys because Dan Wilson, you know, arguably the greatest catcher in Seattle Mariner history, probably and arguably Bobby Ayala, one of the most frustrating pitchers in Mariner history, Brett Boone. Uh, second time around with Seattle was a lot better, but had a heck of a career. Uh, pretty fascinating little deal there. But when he was here, Eric Hansen was a very solid, never quite lived up to the hype of that 1990 season. Um, ever again. In fact, when he went to since after his career kind of puttered out after he got traded to Cincinnati, he had one really good year with Boston in 95. Um, but other than that, not so great. Uh, the list is about to improve substantially, folks. So sorry that I had to get you through all that stuff. Maybe I should have just picked the top seven. Mark Langston. And we can argue that maybe Mark Langston's most important things are that he was traded for Randy Johnson and that he pitched well until he didn't in that one game playoff against the Mariners in 1995. But when he was here and I talked to some folks about this, um, he probably was the Mariners first star, the first, Hey, maybe this can be something. And it's interesting too, because like he's kind of similar to Randy in the fact that like, he just couldn't find a strike zone at first. Like he walked 118 batters in 225 innings in his first year. However, he had a 3.4 ERA and led baseball in strikeouts. I want to say he led baseball in strikeouts three of the four years. I can just confirm that right now. Yep. And look, he was kind of the future. Like he was from everybody I've talked to. This is a little before my time. His first year was the year after I was born. Like he was like, okay, maybe this could be something. Maybe they, the, the Mariners actually have a talent that has built around thing. And I guess people were pretty frustrated by that deal, but it certainly worked out in the Mariners favor. Cause well, we'll talk about when we get there, but uh, yeah. And funnily enough, number five is someone who is also traded for Randy Johnson, only the vice versa. Uh, Freddie Garcia. I mean, 
look, it kind of fell apart, and I think some of that blame is not Garcia's, although he had a couple of really solid years with the White Sox as well, and one really good year with the Yankees, and then um, just kind of became a veteran journeyman. But while he was with Seattle from 99 to 2004, and I'm going to just include his record with uh, Seattle and the White Sox here, Freddie Garcia went 85 and 54, 3.94 ERA, 100 and excuse me, 100, uh, 1,199 innings pitched plus one third. Just can't, oh, just short of the 1,200 mark. And a 921 to 421 strikeout to walk ratio. Led all of baseball in innings pitched in that magical 2001 season. Never really was quite the same pitcher, but. Look, let's let's just be honest. Let's let's take you back to when that trade happened in 1998. Uh, I am in a pop-up trailer in Seaside, Oregon, and I am just listening. And I've heard all of these Randy Johnson rumors all day, all day. Randy Johnson, Randy Johnson, who's getting traded for? Who's getting traded for? And uh, there were rumors of Pat Hankton, and there were rumors of. Uh, him going to Philadelphia. There were a ton of Randy Johnson for Kurt Schilling rumors um, over the span of like three years. Didn't really happen at the deadline this time because Philadelphia, I think, was well out of it. But there were all, I mean, everybody wanted Randy Johnson. Everybody. And the trade happened, and it was Freddie Garcia, who I'd never heard of, and Carlos Gann, who I'd never heard of. And the player to be named later was John Halama. And that was, that got leaked like a couple days after the trade, I want to say. And that's the one I'd heard of just because I'd seen his baseball cards. So I thought Halama was the key to that deal. And Halama did some decent things for the Mariners. But Freddie Garcia, I mean, I don't think you can say the Mariners won that trade because we'll talk about it. But they didn't do terribly for a guy who had no shot of being re-signed. The Mariners burnt that bridge, and we'll talk about all of it. But to get a well above average, not well, not well above average with Seattle, but a, a strong starting shortstop and a number two starter at times your ace for a guy who didn't want to stay here, their fault, but didn't want to stay here, that's pretty good. That's a pretty strong return. And Halama was a, a decent fourth, fifth starter, too. You can do a lot worse than that. Oh, you can do a lot worse than that. But Garcia was solid. It was sad to see him go. Um, the 2004 Mariners were just abysmal. And <laughs> that trade didn't work out. <laughs> Jeremy Reed and Miguel Olivo. And Olivo had a solid career. Jeremy Reed obviously didn't work out even a little bit. Um, can ask some reporters about what it was like to work with Jeremy Reed. But uh, yeah, Freddy Garcia, a pretty strong, easy number four. Okay, the three should be obvious. And even though I'm still debating who number two and who number one is, and I'm going to be debating it even while I'm talking, I can multitask with the best of them. I mean, number three has to be Jamie Moyer. It has to be. I skipped number four. I skipped number four. Hisashi Iwakuma is number four, and that might surprise some people, but it should. It should not. Uh, look, when he was here, Hisashi Iwakuma was... Oh, what you hear right now is a dog that is desperately, desperately trying to uh, get to uh, some garbage. I feed my dogs plenty. They just like garbage more. What can you do? Uh, <laughs> Hisashi Iwakuma was unbelievably good. Like 2013, he was a legitimate Cy Young Award candidate. A legitimate Cy Young candidate. I believe he finished third. I'll confirm that right now. He did. And he was strong in 2014, 2015. Wasn't as good and dealt with injury stuff. 2016, he was solid again. 2017, obviously, the injury stuff. But in terms of, like, ceiling, he's easily top three on this list. Easily. 
I guess the argument you could make is maybe uh, Cliff Lee belongs higher in ceiling because, but it was only half a season. And those guys who are on the current rotation who are going to make it, um, you know, they'll pass him too. But uh, Hisashi Iwakuma does not get talked about enough as being an unbelievably good starting pitcher. Like, I didn't see that coming. Like, I was a little younger. I was uh, 29 when he signed. So, you know, I, I was just basing it on, like, the reports I read. But everything suggested mid-rotation starter. For three years, he was much better than a mid-rotation arm. Much better. It was fun. It was fun. And he deserves credit. And shame on you, Kevin Matter, for everything you said about that man. Shame on you. makes me really mad all right number three easily jamie moyer i mean it's not close he was here for 11 years he posted a 3.97 era he was he's got to be well up there in war i didn't actually look up the war leaders other than for floyd banister just to confirm um was he ever dominant like in terms of missing bats and stuff no did he have some years where the long ball really tripped him up? Yeah. And then some. But he had a couple of years where he was as like a legitimate number one starting pitcher in terms of results, in terms of ERA, in terms of innings pitched, all of that stuff. Went 21 and 7 with a 3.27 ERA in 2003. Went 20 and 6 with a 3.43 ERA in 2001. How many guys can you say win 20 games more than one, uh, two times? More than once, excuse me. He won 17 games in 1997 with a 3.86 ERA. He was awesome after that trade. It's kind of funny. Let's go back to 1996. So the Mariners made trades for two starting pitchers that year, and they traded for uh, Terry Moholland, and they traded for Jamie Moyer. Now, I got to be honest, I was more excited for Moholland because, I mean, he, I – remembered him well from the 1993 world series and uh i thought you know maybe this is uh the the guy to plug right behind uh randall k johnson well no he wasn't so good but moyer was great darren bragg for jamie moyer you know as bad as you feel about uh as bad as you feel about um the trade we shouldn't talk about the heathcliff slocum deal you won that one. You won that one by a lot. So so you didn't always get us Boston. Got us a lot. But, I mean, look, I don't think Jamie Moyer is a Hall of Famer. Um, Just not enough seasons like the 2001, 2003 seasons. Some good seasons in between. Don't get me wrong. But just not quite enough of those. But, like... 25 years of pitching 25 years of being a starting pitcher that's incredible that is incredible folks 269 wins which again we'll talk about i'll mention it again the, the win totals flawed it's it's beyond flawed it's a bad stat but it does give you some indication of how long this guy was able to pitch and I, I'm, I'll be honest with you, too. Right now, I am kind of, uh, I don't know what the right term is. I don't know who to put at number one. Because I hate having to put one of these guys at number two. I mean, let's make the case for and the case against Randy Johnson being at number one. Uh, the case for is he's the most dominant pitcher in Seattle Mariner history. It's not close. He was also there for two of the best seasons of this team's history. Heck, more than that, really. He was unbelievable. He was my favorite player as a kid. I always made sure that I could, whenever I could, schedule stuff around Randy Johnson starts. And that was hard. Heck, I can remember um, 
we went to uh i had a baseball tournament in i don't remember where it was but randy was oh no it was in high school it was it was a game we had in peninsula and it was opening day was our first uh our one of our first games at uh river ridge shout out river ridge high school go hawks and i knew i wasn't gonna play that day because i wasn't very good and um i was I, I could throw strikes as a pitcher but i certainly wasn't gonna be like the opening day starter for a high school team a, a bad high school team but a high school team nonetheless and like i paid attention to what we were doing but all i was thinking was like how's randy pitching wish i would have had like it would have been nice to have these cell phones we have now to find out how randy was pitching i cared much more about that he, it was an event to watch him. And this other guy is an event too. I mean, the case against is he just wasn't here all that long. 89. I mean, it, he was here pretty long. He was here pretty long. Huh? 89 to 98 is not a short run. Huh. And then on the other side, Felix Hernandez. Oh, Felix. I mean, the case for Felix Hernandez is he's Felix Hernandez. And yeah, it fell apart. Oh boy, did it fall apart. It stinks that it fell apart. The Mariners deserve a ton of credit, for lack of a better term, for why it fell apart. It was overused. I mean, in 2010, this guy gave you 250 innings, 249.2 to be precise. But he averaged over 230 innings from 2009 to 2012. And then in 2013, he only had 204. In 2014, it was back to 236. I mean, the peak of Felix Hernandez is 2009 to 2014 and let me just give you these numbers okay 86 and 56 i'm, I'm gonna give you the win loss i'm sorry it just gives you an, a little bit of an idea a 2.73 era a 1358 strikeouts 356 walks an era plus of 141 an fip of 2.89 strikeout to walk ratio of 3.81 he was pretty darn good in 2015 and 2016, too. And he was good a couple of years before that as well. This is hard. And it means nothing, but it's hard. I'm going to go Randy 2, Felix 1. And I immediately regret it, but I have to. That dominance of that long, I don't think Randy quite matches that. Now, Randy was more dominant at his peak. Don't, don't get me wrong. And I think it is worth pointing out that Randy had a couple injury-plagued years with the Mariners. He also had a couple of years where, I mean, he just flat couldn't throw strikes. Tom House deserves every possible congressional medal for what he did with randy johnson to tighten that delivery go watch even the 1990 no hitter go watch randy's mechanics and then watch what he is seven years later five years later less than that just just watch the difference but for a time frame thing just watch the 1990 no hitter and then watch the 1995 one game playoff and look at how much more in tune his body was when he was pitching at that peak. Like his stuff was nasty, nasty when he was that young too, or when he was back then. He had some good years, but he also, I mean, his mechanics, he had no idea where the baseball was going. No idea. Can't say that about Felix. And how about the fact that he was here for 15 years too? I got to put him at one. If you're asking me to rank their overall careers, it's not even close. 
feel Randy Johnson is the greatest pitcher to wear a Seattle Mariner uniform, but Felix Hernandez, I think is the greatest starting pitcher for the Mariners. If I had to rank them, I hope that makes some sense. If it doesn't, it doesn't, but yeah, that's, let's just go over that list. Uh, one more time. One, Felix. Two, Randy. Three, Jamie. Four, Iwakuma. Five, The Chief, Freddy. Six, Langston. Seven, Hanson. Eight, more. Nine, Paxton. Ted, Bannister. I know. I know. I don't like that I picked Felix either. I don't. It's not that I don't like that I picked Felix. It's that I don't like that I pitched, picked against Randy. I know. <laughs> I'm upset about it too. Yes, I was talking to a dog. This video might suck. That's okay. And I still hope you watched it to the end because here's something really cool you can win. All you have to do is hit like on this video, hit subscribe, and comment down below on this video who your favorite pitcher on this list is and who your favorite starting pitcher that I didn't mention in this video is. So I did not, and that I mentioned Castillo, I mentioned Kirby, I mentioned Gilbert, all those guys. So that doesn't count. Your favorite starting pitcher that I didn't mention in this video, I'm going to make it difficult, Dave Fleming. So now you can't mention him either. But all you have to do is mention that stuff or mention your favorite pitcher on this list, favorite pitcher I did not mention in this video, starting pitcher in this video. Comment on below, hit like, hit subscribe, all that stuff. You know the drill. And the winner is going to get a big dumper autographed Tops Chrome Stadium card. Chrome. Chrome. Orange out of 25. That's like a $300 card if it PSA 10s. And it's, it's certainly more valuable. Look, the Matt Brash card, which I mailed out. Congratulations to our winner. Um... That's a valuable card. This has a chance to be significantly more valuable. But I really want to get to 500 subscribers, and I really like you guys. And I really like um, it feels good when I help people out. So, yeah, there you go. That's all you have to do, and you get a chance to uh, win something really cool. Apologize for the dogs, except I love them even more than you guys. Apologize for not... Uh, having a better way to edit out sounds like that, but it doesn't matter. But yeah, the 10 greatest starting pitchers in Seattle Mariner history. Have a good one.